What's up everyone and welcome to Method in the Madness. This is the podcast that not only delves deep into design and creativity, but also leadership, productivity and all things personal development. Episode 3 is here and in this episode I sit down with Dave Ward, the creative director and co-founder of Create Future, which if you don't know is an awesome little creative consultancy based here in Edinburgh. But in just three years, Create Future has gone from the three founders working together to already a staff of 12. And they work with some pretty awesome clients like Penguin Random House, BBC, Edrington, Expedia, and even Adidas. And, you know, you guys name it, these guys are killing it. And in addition to this, I also worked with Dave when we both worked at Realize. So it was really good to kind of catch up with them. And we have a great chat, to be fair. And it strays off the path a little bit, but it's really funny, I think. But we hear about Dave's journey from quitting his job, you know, starting his family, moving city and starting his own business, which was actually Dave de-risking his life, believe it or not. And we have a good chat about design thinking, which is a great topic to discuss. And more specifically, what intrigued Dave about it so much and why Create Future decided to kind of focus our business around it. We even get into cars. We're both kind of car guys and petrol heads. So I asked Dave kind of what brands he'd love to work with and why. And, you know, what would you love to do for them as well? And since Dave is such a chilled guy and I've worked with him for a number of years, um, I've always wanted to know what pisses him off. So I, I finally get to find out eventually what pisses him off about the creative industry, which is quite funny. So without much further ado, please welcome Dave Ward to Method in the Madness. Dave, welcome to the show and thank you for getting up so early to make the time to do the show before work. I really appreciate it. <laughs> no worries at all. Uh, for the listeners, it is the morning and we are in Leith. So if you hear seagulls squawking or people piling into the office, deal with it, I suppose. That is why uh, there's many things I can control, but seagull squawking is not one of them, unfortunately. But Dave, you were the first person I actually chatted to about doing the idea of a podcast. And what did you say? Not a bloody chance. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a great idea. You should do it. Definitely do it. And here we are, episode three already. Oh, you are one of the founders of uh, Create Future and the creative director of Create Future. How would you best describe your work, your philosophy, and the work that you do there? Oh, the philosophy of Create Future? Yeah. Um, well, the philosophy of Create Future, the name does an awful lot for us. So, you know, we, we want to help companies to create their own future, whether that's uh, product design um, or uh, around marketing and marketing strategy. And uh, often it, it then starts to tend into what needs to be done internally to make that happen. So that can be the teams, etc. The more emotional philosophy is really around uh, trying to make our work sort of fast, fun, collaborative. Um, and generally that's the criteria that we'll look at work by is, you know, is a client that will work in a really collaborative way. Will they be able to work fast or, you know, are they an institution that won't really let them do that? And um, will they come along for the ride? Will they, will they have a bit of fun with it? And will the project be interesting? Another way of looking at it was that we, as the founders, wanted to find find projects that would get us in the, uh, in the right type of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so try and find, try to find projects that you know are that are challenging, um, and that you think you can actually make a difference with. So does that kind of help you be quite selective about the work you take on and the work that you maybe turn away? Yes, and it's been it's been easier than we thought. And actually, having values has been really helpful for that. And um, yeah, when work comes in, it's it sounds a little bit arrogant, but you, 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 we turn down quite a bit of work. Um, and generally, it's because they're they're looking to do it in quite an old school fashion. We use a lot of uh, design thinking practices, and um, it's very collaborative. And we do we try to get to a prototype as quickly as possible. And often, 
clients, well, certain organizations are still in quite a, a, a very waterfall way of thinking. Mm, yeah. And so that it just won't work. And they'll be honest, you know, it might be the person that's looking to hire you really, really wants to work in a fun, fast, collaborative way, but they know that the business they work for won't be able to do it. Or, um, and that, yeah. And so there's just a little moment of honesty as to whether or not you're, you're the right fit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be that really annoying podcast host, but could you just make sure that you're speaking like into the big uh, foam circle? <laughs> it's very awkward because you can't see each other's mouths moving, but no worries. You get used to I want to stare while. into your beautiful eyes. Uh, you can still do that. It's fine. Uh, the other two founders and yourself worked together at agencies in the past. And could you tell us about kind of what inspired the three of you to get together to do your own thing? Was there a particular aha moment or was it chats in the pub or a company or both? I mean, you, there's definitely chats in the pub after a few beers over the years, but, um, and there were different factors for each of us. We're very different people. And that's, that's why it works because we're very different people. You know, the, the, Jessica Mullen as as managing director and Nathan Fullwood as strategy director and myself as creative director. We take very different lenses onto the same things. That's good. So, and almost different, yeah, di different perspectives and different approaches. And that whenever circumstances changed in that uh, I was coming to, I've been at my previous gig for, um, a long time, seen it gone through SEAL, op opened up the London office with a few other folk, um, taken on a lot of challenges, grew a lot, and I knew that it was it was time to make a change. It's not time to make a change. <laughs> um, and a, a lot of that was personal stuff too. So I just had my first kid. I was living in London. Yeah. And um, if I had stayed in London, I would have had to take on a crazy mortgage and kept going at the, at, kept doing the creative director London thing yeah. while having a kid. And I, I just didn't think that that was going to be something I wanted to do. And I knew I wanted to set up a business. This is a little bit rambly. But that's all. No, no. Um, I knew I wanted to set up a business and that if I, had a kid and got into a big mortgage, I couldn't take on the risk of doing that again. Yeah. So there was a crunch point and that was the major thing for me was look, you either do it now, you know, shit or get off the pot. And so that's whenever I started making phone calls to, to uh, Jessica and I've been talking about it for a long time. It wasn't like it was out of the blue. Yeah. But uh, it was a case of, well, that thing we've been talking about for a long time. Do you think now is the time? And luckily it was for her too. That's awesome then. Yeah, and then similarly Nathan, you know, it was it was. So you're kind of going against time. the whole, don't do business with your mates. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be working out for you so far, though. <laughs> well, uh, no, because you should you should at least be able to enjoy each other's company. Yeah, and I think if you were to try and start a business with somebody that you couldn't also be a friend with, then you would find it very difficult. Yeah, because you're you're about to get exceptionally close to somebody whenever you set a business up. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Create Future is obviously very big on design thinking, and your kind of business revolves around that. But what specifically about design thinking is it that attracted like what attracted you to focus your business around? Around that, yeah. Um, well, for, for those that are listening that um, haven't spent a lot, a lot of time with design thinking, the most succinct way of, of explaining it that I have is is almost using the designer's toolkit to solve a wider range of problems. So you go through as a designer, um, trying to simplify and, and understand what the question is you're being asked. You look out into the world, take a user-centered view and find out what the, uh, what the world actually needs. Um, you look at analogous examples of where that problem has been solved before. You come up with ideas, you prototype, and then you test. And we as designers talk about that a lot. We talk about, you know, how, we, you know, that's the ideal process. And 99 times out of 10, you never actually get to do that. You rarely get to test. You rarely you say you're user-centered, but you never actually go out and talk to a single yeah. user. Um, you feel guilty about looking at analogous insight, looking at other people that have designed things the same way, because as a creative, you want to be wholly original. You know, there are, there are at each of those stages, there are barriers. 
And what design thinking is, is doing is looking at that process and saying, well, you know, that's that process is used in engineering for solving how to make a plane slow down. Yeah. You know, you, and I'll just inside there is looking at, well, how, how, what other things need to slow down quickly? Let's look at Formula One cars. So you're using a designer's toolkit to solve a wider range of problems. And that can be everything from what product should we make next to right back to design issues, you know, um, what should our design toolkit look like and how should it scale and grow? So I, I, going back to your original question, what excited me about that when I started to hear about how that was being used in, in you know, the likes of Silicon Valley, et cetera, was that it has core tenets that I believe in. I do believe in each of those stages and I think they're important, but also it's about moving faster Right. You see things like the first time I heard of it was really around uh, what Google Ventures were doing in their sprint process, where you take somebody from a problem that has been a nutty thing that has been annoying them for a long time in a business through to an answer, uh, a prototype, and some uh, consumer voice back, some insight from the customer about whether it's right or not in five days. Yeah, it's brilliant. I love design sprints. Any, well, anyone that's been in a, I mean, it's not. I think people have different lenses on because of their own experiences. So if, if you've done a design sprint and it's failed, then uh, or you're in a leadership role in a business and your team have asked you to do a design sprint and you were expecting that at the end of it you were going to get the finished product, then frankly you're nuts. Yeah. I mean, it, and the expectation was wrong from the yeah, get-go because yeah, that's expect- never what you set out to do in Absolutely. the first place. And you were trying to get if, if you know you're trying to get a team together in a room for a week and expect that there's not going to be um, differences of opinion or people aren't going to try and walk out and go to a meeting or get bored at certain points. You know, it's not going to be easy, but at the end of it, you will have cracked the back of a problem. Yeah. And do you want to wait six months and spin the wheels before finding out what the answer of that was? And the other part of it is just that you do make a prototype. So you are going to design an anger. You're going to make something. Now that's going to be Goldilocks quality. You know, it's not too hot, not too cold, <laughs> not too, not too it's high. It's a brilliant way of describing it. Yeah, yeah, and it's different for every project. You know, it's not too high fidelity, not too low fidelity. Just, just enough to answer that question, which is why the first stage of making sure you have a very single-minded question is so important. But that is that's being a designer. Yeah. And I think designers forget about that. They forget that they're problem solvers and they think that they color things in for a living. And they think that their interactions with other people is asking, please love me, you know, subjectively, what do you think of my work? Yeah. Frankly, no, that's not being a designer. It really isn't. No. And if that's the way that you're sitting today and that's the way that you're designing, then you need to stop and reconsider the value of what you do. You are a problem solver. Yeah. And I think like there's a, another podcast that I listened to called The Crazy One and by this guy called Stephen Gates who works at Envision and he always keeps going on like design is having a moment like and not enough of us are taking advantage of it. Like there's never been a more prolific time mm. for design to be embedded within businesses and, you know, things like design thinking and using what I call true design in terms of just problem solving, the intent yeah. of solving a problem that's never been so popular and I think yeah. not enough of us are taking advantage of it but it's great to see that so many more companies and industries that you never thought design would play such a prolific role would be you know actually adopting those kind of values so I think yeah. it's kind of great and it's the, the value of design the value, whether people use the language the word design or not because I think certainly in the UK it's it still comes with the connotation of uh, of a designer being um, somebody that colors things in. Yeah. Um, but we're starting to... So my dad calls it in. I know. I'm, I, know. <laughs> I think, I, I think we, we all find it hard to describe what we do. And definitely, mm. uh, if if you're not, in, you're not in the field of design, it can be quite scary. I remember whenever I first started, um, a woman gave me a, a brilliant piece of advice, which was that to never forget that to others what you do is magic. And what she meant by that was that as a designer, whenever you present your final work, People can't see the workings. They can't see how you got there. And a little bit like you watching somebody who can properly illustrate and draw and sketch something in two seconds flat. Yeah. It looks like magic. You know, how did you do that? You know, you must have been born with that talent. 
and the fact is of course there's no such thing you know we right. we, we grow muscle over time um but yeah i think design needs to go through the change and it feels like it's the start of a of a, of a new story arc in what design is yeah great future I have not long celebrated your third birthday congratulations <laughs> must have been easy to blow out those candles uh it doesn't feel like three years ago when uh you left your kind of last agency but how would you sum up those past three years kind of inspiring stressful surreal all of them <laughs> too quick to stand back and reflect well i mean you've had you've had a busy three years yourself uh yeah you've i have gone through a few a few changes yeah a few different changes um both personally and professionally yeah. but change yeah change it's ahead. kind of like, it's just like one of these things that sometimes you forget to kind of look back i suppose mm. but i suppose running your own business for the first time just to kind of get a bit of insight into that like how has that been is it versus your expectation of what it was going to be like going in versus reality easier harder well i think well you know as I say, you, you've gone through your own stuff in the in the last three last couple of years, and all positive. You know, different changes. You know, in your in in, in job and relationship, and um, where you live and things like that. And they're making the decision to buy a new house, to get married, to change job, to do anything like that is is change, and change is violent. <laughs> you know, even if it's positive, you know, you, you worry about getting married. You worry about, you know, is am I making the right decision? This is a big commitment. You worry about the same thing with taking a, a mortgage out. Um, but whenever you get through the other side, there's a there's a change in yourself. Yeah, you know, and and I find certainly whenever I got married that I didn't realize there was a niggle in the back of my brain that had now been relaxed. You know, I I I was like, oh no, no, this. You know, I've been with my partner for ten years. Hmm. Uh, sorry, married ten years, been with her for almost uh, fourteen, fifteen. Um, that I didn't realize the commitment actually would calm me. Like, okay, yeah, that's we are an awesome couple, and this is great, and I and I can do this, yeah. and I can move forward, and I can do more. Um, and I don't need to be worrying about whether I'm making the right decisions or not. Um, and it's as, as I was saying earlier, the the starting my own business thing was was very much um, a circumstance of it, it had to it had to happen at that time in my mind that's the way I'd framed it in my mind you know if if I stay in London as a creative director and have a kid then I need to provide for that kid there and I can't bring risk into my life anymore now looking back that was nuts <laughs> absolute nuts right so so wait a second you don't want to bring risk into your life but you've just had a kid you're going to give up your high paying job you're going to move back to, to Edinburgh and you're going to try and start up a business with no clients and no knowledge yourself some may say that's riskier than sure. what your the alternative was just a little bit <laughs> so when I look at the back at the last three years I, I think it was it was violent you know, it was it was a big change. It took on a lot of risk. It had a big effect on my mental health. Um, and what came out the other end, though, was like most of those big changes. I I, I feel that I've grown quite a bit. Yeah. I feel like I know a lot more. I know a lot more of what I do and don't want to do. And I'm I'm glad that I did it. And I'm really glad that I had a partner who was willing to do that with me. Um, and really glad that I have business partners who were willing to make that change and take that risk at the same time yeah it's quite a big change to make in your life that's for sure starting your own business just as you're having a kid just as yeah. you're moving cities <laughs> and things like that as well yeah and then halfway through year two i decided to have another kid yeah <laughs> well you know Sink or swim, <laughs> that whole mentality. But you know, the, the sinking isn't as bad as you probably think. No. Uh, for those people who are listening that are maybe thinking about, you know, or maybe in a job and want to kind of go out on their own or start their new business venture with friends or whoever it may be, is there anything that you wish you knew three years ago that is so glaringly obvious to you now that you wish you knew going in? Um... No, I mean, if do you know a little bit like whenever 
And the person who buys all the baby books about how to raise a baby is the person who doesn't need the books. <laughs> yeah. You know, you've, you've already, the, the one thing that you need is just the drive to do it. So if you, if you don't have that big goal, if there, if there wasn't, if there wasn't a big enough itch that you need to scratch that you're going to go through that, then you shouldn't do it. And I know that that's, that's hard for somebody who's listening, who maybe is thinking about it and they're then going to question, well, you know, is my drive big enough? Mm. Um, it, if you just want to get somewhere, you know, then you're going to get it. It's a bit like, you know, I want to drive. I'm going to do my driving test. You just have to know that you want to do it. Yeah. And, and once you kind of step off the precipice, that's what's going to keep you going. It's like, well, I've got to stop myself from falling. So I'm going to make sure that this happens. Yeah. Um, and that's, I guess, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, a little bit of self-belief is probably what I could have done with a little bit more of back then. I have a really, really good uh, coach and I've been going to him for about five, uh, about five years, probably longer now, maybe six years. And, um, and yeah, he was, he was very helpful. And, um, and my, again, family and friends were quite helpful just in, in telling you to, uh, to wise up and you're going to be all right. And, you know, keep driving through really good clients as well, especially in our Was age. it just the, you know, the, the whole premise of starting your own business, did that, just did you just begin to kind of question your own ability a little bit even though kind of like you're saying the person who buys all the baby books doesn't need uh is probably the one person that doesn't need the books did you just kind of have a bit of a self-doubt moment about whether or not i'm actually going to be able to do this or every day <laughs> um yeah yeah i mean of course you do i think if that's human isn't it mm. You know, if you don't if you don't doubt yourself, then you're probably a psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or you just are glaringly unaware of what's yeah. ahead. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but you also you need to temper that with knowing the value of what you do, mm. especially if you're going to you're going to sell a business, and somebody's going to ask you to do things. You know, do you remember the first time somebody asked you to do a homer, mm. and then three months later you're still doing it, and you didn't actually ask them about payment you're about to set up a business yeah you know you need to understand that you need to get paid and you need to understand the value of your time and the value of what you make mm. and if you don't value it yourself then how on earth is somebody else going to value it so i think the, the two things need to be tempered you need to doubt yourself in order to drive yourself forward but you also need to value what you do in order to make sure that it's grounded in something that's sustainable was that a bit of a learning curve like kind of learning to you know ask the sometimes difficult questions you know you don't have unlike you know working in a big agency you don't have a team of people that kind of deal with that stuff for you you like mm -hmm. at the very start there was literally just three of you so you kind of all had to play many many roles rolled into one is that a bit of a learning curve to kind of you know discussing payment and valuing your time and saying no to stuff because it wasn't a right fit when really we're starting out can we still say no to stuff is that allowed you know all this kind of um jessica and nathan are well jessica being a managing director is much closer to the the, the getting paid part mm. of the business but also the strategic part of the business and how it goes and, and making sure that everything runs properly and i'm exceptionally lucky um that uh, she wanted to partner up in this um i think from my side though have you ever seen the 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 um, the doodle, the image, the the evolution of a creative. Yeah. So it's uh, it's the evolution of man. You know, it starts with a chimpanzee and you yeah. know, you know goes through five, six stages, turning into man. And uh, the chimpanzee above it has the icons of the creative suite. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time it gets to being a, a associate creative director, the creative suite is now just Illustrator and Photoshop, and PowerPoint is in there. <laughs> and by the time it gets to creative director. The creative suite's now gone and it's PowerPoint and Excel. Yeah. And eventually it gets to chief creative officer and apparently you're supposed to just be drinking champagne at that point. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure many chief creative officers would agree with that. No. But, uh, but there, there's a truth in it, which is that as you get as you get better as a creative, you do less design. And this is a very roundabout way to answering your question about your skill set. Mm. Um what replaces doing design is uh, is managing 
the client relationship and selling in the creative work. So I, I often said a big part of being a creative director is to remove subjectivity on behalf of the creative team. So if we're presenting work to somebody, it's to remove subjectivity, remind them of what they wanted, what they needed, and how this answers the brief, because often they'll forget, and their gut emotional response will kick yeah. in. And sadly, your gut emotional response is different to the person that's sitting next to you. Hence why we, you know, oh, yeah. paint our kitchens in different colors. <laughs> you know, it's purely subjective. So whenever it came to running a business is to remember that I was very lucky in the businesses I've been before where they put me in positions where I had to do that. You know, I, I became a creative director. I became somebody who had to, uh, to go out and win new work and also make sure that the work that we were doing was delivered. And I think that that's seeing things through to the end and making sure that work actually gets delivered. Competency is more important than creativity sometimes. Somebody, people are buying you. They're buying your, your uh, will to get something made. And creative ideas are very easy to kill. Hmm. And a creative director needs to make sure it gets made be quite protective over it yeah and that it works i mean that's it has to work but it also it's not going to work if it doesn't get made as you can either answer this like per personally or you know as a business like who or what are some of your kind of biggest inspirations and where do you draw some of your motivation you know as a business owner creative director consultancy oh um I think it's it's uh, it's tricky. I go through I go through fits and starts with this. Um, I, f I find looking to others for inspiration um, and looking online can be a bit of a, a negative spiral. Yeah, I'm the same. Like I find as the years go on, I look less at creative work for inspiration and I get inspiration from other sources mm, that yeah. aren't anything to do with design yeah which is quite random I didn't think that was going to be the case because I was always the person that was like first thing in the morning load up dribble and awards.com and all this kind of stuff just to yeah. kind of get your creative juices flowing for now most of the time it's a podcast a article on a completely different subject or something like that that I can well, it's probably the the evolution of creative thing again. Isn't yeah, it? <laughs> yeah. I bet you're doing you're doing less design than you were five years ago. Uh, yes, yeah. very safe to say that I'm doing less hands on design. But I think the same thing applies of um, when it's really important if you're a younger designer to keep a scrapbook, hmm. and it's it's as important as you as you mature to keep keeping a scrapbook of stuff that you think is awesome. Um, my, the most used app on my phone is the camera app. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. you know you're just constantly just grabbing stuff and it's a really good habit to get into going back to your question though about you know the influences I think that if you if you focus too much on who you want to be like then it seems like an unattainable goal but if you if you look at somebody that you really admire and, and, and leave it at that then it's okay um, you know I have plenty of people that I admire but they're, they're you know, guys like Stefan Sagmeister. I always thought was really cool. Yeah. But but I love Stefan Sagmeister. Um, one because he was an agitator, but on, on the other side because um, he thought a little bit differently about what he wanted from his life. You know, he had this theory that um, in retirement, you know, if you retire at sixty five and you live until let's say you know, well, as a man, probably around eighty five, then those years that you have there, he didn't want them at the end of his life. So he, he would work three years and then he would take one year off. And he saw it as, well, look, I'm just going to keep working until I'm 85 and I'll draw down from my retirement now. <laughs> you know, little things like that. Yeah. They, they're like, that's that's a lovely way of thinking about uh, a difference in, in, in way of living. Um, and bold as well to be yeah. able to go, oh, yeah, I'll just take a year off every two, yeah. three years, which some people would be afraid to do, but yeah. he clearly doesn't give a shit. Um, I worried a lot about legacy uh, um, earlier in my, in my career. I worried that you know I wasn't making something that was wholly for me. 
and that was going to be you know stand as a piece of craft that people would look at over over time. I worry about that a lot less now, and I bring that up in, in reference to this question because I think whenever I looked at people, I looked at them from that standpoint. It was like you're known. Yeah, that's a good you, way of looking at it. You have you have a legacy now that um, I'm admiring you, and I'm in another country. That's that's amazing. The truth is. I think especially in design, um, we everyone stands on the shoulders of giants whenever they start designing. We all leverage other people's uh, other people's design work. Mm. Um, there's a there's that sort of whether it's engineering or whether it is design. You know, the the second that something is realised, it's it's no longer um, it's no. It's, it's almost forgotten about. There's, there's, um, oh God, I think a book's called Understanding Media. There's a statement in that where it's if you think about how, um, whenever we've had the first piece of cinema footage, 26 frames running in sequence, and the effort that it must have taken to get to the point where you're able to take photographs that quickly, stitch them together, and then project them back again. Yeah. And the effort that must have taken to get to that point and the surprise in everyone's faces as soon as they saw that and saw that we had moving picture. And in that very instant, all of the effort disappeared. Nobody ever thought again about how those Difficult images got was. stuck together. And they simply moved on to creating the next piece of craft on top of it, you know, which then bore color, sound. You know, you're into animation. You're into, you know, it, it all layered on top of that. And now we never think about how uh, a picture moves. Yeah. We barely even question how something uh, that's in our living room, like a TV, actually works. Um, and that's again, uh, you, you get. I love a good ramble. Um, it's not, it's to my not mind, <laughs> to my mind, that that that's a little bit uh, like legacy. You know, you, you kind of have to accept that. You're, somebody's going to press delete and your design work's gone, you know, or that in 10, 15 years looking back, it's going to look quite childish, whatever you've done. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yes, yeah. you know, we love, we love looking at things like uh, the Volkswagen ad, you know, think small, but not for its craft. While, while the, you know, copywriting and the, and the art direction is beautiful. Mm. Um, it's because of the thought, the thought process that went in it. You go, that was smart, you know, at its time, in America, when everyone was was looking for the bigger, better car, um, and the more reliable car, there's an advertisement that came out with a car with the word "lemon" written underneath it. <laughs> that's the, that's the legacy. It was the thought. So design difficult because we we focus off. Well, I find whenever I was a younger designer, I focused on getting my craft better. Um, when actually it, it was. You know, the craft was never going to be good enough in 5, 10, 15 years' time. Yeah, well, because the goalposts change all the time. Yeah. Like, if I look at, like, a folio piece of something that I was, like, immensely proud of five, six, seven years ago, I look at it now, I'm just like, oh, my God, like, that's mm -hmm. dreadful. Yeah. Like, literally dreadful. And then, but that's with, you know, years of experience. I didn't top in a different lens and different mm. trends have come and gone and blah, 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 blah. But it's kind of weird how that happens. But like you say, like the idea behind, you know, yeah. what we did would would maybe be the thing that lasts yeah. rather than the actual craft and the execution of it. Absolutely, and and don't um, uh, don't mix up artistry and design in in that statement. Mm. Uh, sorry, in my statement, uh, which is that you know if. If you're a designer, again, you're a problem solver. If if you're an illustrator, if you are a copywriter, as in you, you write you write the written word, not to solve a problem, but uh, for the for the joy of reading it, or a photographer, those things don't date as badly. You know, a, a beautiful hand hand drawn picture is, is still going to be beautiful mm. later down the line, but design ages. <laughs> yeah. As a business owner, like I've never run my own business, so this is kind of why I'm asking the question. But do you feel like is there a stress or anxiety that kind of comes with running a business? Because you know, you guys started out as three friends, all kind of equally in, so to speak. But then you've grown to how big are you guys now? It's twelve of us. Twelve. So is there like a, a sense of responsibility that kind of comes with? Like I'm responsible for these people, and they're obviously relying on us for a paycheck and being able to pay their bills is like, is there like a kind of mental kind of anxiety or stress that comes along with that? 
Yeah, yeah, it's one of the many. Um, yeah, there's the um, uh, was this Simon Sinek saying, uh, you know, leaders eat last. Mm. Well, that's true. You know, you you um, you know, the the team need to get paid, and the team need to be uh, need to enjoy their work, and they need to feel that they're growing in their careers, and that means that you eat last. You know, yeah. if if I would love to be sitting down, you know, we we work with clients like um, Alidas and Expedia and Penguin, and I would love to sit all day uh, designing for stuff like that and, and you know, filling my, uh, working on the stuff that makes me feel good. But the reality is that I, I need to let others do some of the, the more creative design tasks because the business needs to be, needs to be run and the next client needs to come in. Yeah. And a meeting needs to happen. Um, so yeah, yeah, you definitely, you definitely do. And, and I think I have certainly worked in environments where they maybe didn't respect that as much. Um, certainly, you know, the, were if, if somebody comes into your business and they're going to work for you, they can't have the same amount of buy-in as, as you do. You know, they're, they, they didn't start it. And they they have they see the world through their lens, which is about you know their career and cr- progression path. Mm. And you hired them for that. You hired them for their ability, and you hired them to support them in their career and progression path. And the day that they leave, you need to give them all of the thanks in the world for helping uh, in a symbiotic relationship. They grew their career, and they helped grow your business. So there's there is. There's the need to look after them, and there's the need to make sure that it is a two-way street. Yeah, and you kind of touched on it slightly there, but do you find it hard to kind of relinquish some of the kind of fun, creative tasks to people, or you have you gotten more comfortable with that over time, or do you still kind of have that? Oh, I wouldn't have done it that way, but you kind of have to let them do it. Craig and I were discussing this on the last podcast. Who was? Craig Black and I. Ah, Craig Black. I love um, sure Just because obviously Craig. I was asking him because he obviously recruits a whole bunch of people sometimes to help him paint a mural. And, yeah. you know, like, considering it's literally his name is his, is his business, I was kind of asking him, like, do you find it hard to kind of relinquish the control sometimes? Because, you know, sometimes as a creative leader, it is difficult to, when you know there's possibly a better avenue to explore to kind of relinquish that control over to your team sometimes. Do you find that difficult? Um, I think there's two sides to it. One, you have uh, a good designer wants to have discussion about their work. And um, often that can be they, they know what the answer is to the problem they're trying to solve but they just need to exercise the thought process with somebody that they hopefully respect. And that way, whenever they go and carry on working on that, they, they do do so with newfound confidence. Mm. The, so, I mean, that is, that's all creatives, I think. I, I don't know how, uh, and I know people do, and I, and I beg love for people that have found a way to, to work from work from home and to manage their own time better and have a better work-life balance through that. I couldn't do it because I would need to spend time with other creatives. I, I, I don't have the self-confidence to, to not have to discuss my work with other people. And I know quite a lot of creatives in that in that boat. Um, on the other side, what you're talking about is is that at, at the end of the day, I'm the creative director. I'm, I'm responsible for the output of, of Create Future. If it isn't up to standard, it's my fault. So, I think as long as everyone in the team sort of gets the reason why you're you're having those discussions, then it's not it's not really going to be an issue. Yeah. You know, if um, my coach always said, you know, if if you're if you're ruminating over a problem which is to do with the business, reframe it as what is best for the business. So if you're having to have if you're having to, to phone a client and say, look, I know that you wanted that design work today. Um, it's going to be another day because I'm not happy with the quality of the work. That's a really hard phone call to make, but there's nobody in this world that isn't going to understand the reason why you're doing it mm. and are going to respect the reason why you're doing it. 
So similarly, if you need to have that discussion with, with the team and say, look, guys, I don't think this answers the brief, you know, then the, as long as it's what's right for the business and it's done with the respect for the team and what they're, they're trying to do and the effort they've put in, and perhaps you didn't brief them well enough, and perhaps the brief wasn't a good brief, <laughs> and perhaps you didn't give them the tools to do it, you didn't give them the time to do it, you didn't give them the emotional support to do it. Um, but at the end of the day, you you need to sort that stuff out and you need to look after what's best for the business. Yeah. You mentioned it earlier in the podcast, but you are a dad of two. Mm -hmm. So how do you personally juggle the running of your own business, getting involved in the work yourself? And I know you've obviously got kind of international clients as well. So finding the time to go over and work with your clients directly and obviously spending enough time with the family and keeping on top of everything that needs to be kept on top of as a new dad. Do you have any like particular habits or kind of ways that you manage this? Do you protect certain bits of your time or whatever it may be? And you, like, I'm not a dad and I don't have my own business, but I find it hard to switch off at times and kind of separate work and personal life. So it's kind of curious. Yeah, yeah. I've gotten better at that. Um, yeah, you start to realize you can't do certain things. <laughs> you know, you used to... You used to <laughs> Go out and have uh, beers after work on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, sometimes Monday, Tuesday. <laughs> um, and um, I used to work late into the nights. You know, I, ironically, I probably, I probably work late into the nights more uh, whenever I was a designer than whenever I was a business leader. Um, and a big part of that is having kids. Hmm. So there's there's no there's no point in really <laughs> there's no point in having kids and not not being a dad to them. You know, yeah. what's the you know I think it's it's tricky. And it, my my dad was an entrepreneur as well, although that, that word comes with a bit of a, a bit of baggage these days. My dad ran a business, he was a publican. Um which meant that he had to work in the, late into the nights. You know, by the very nature of the business. Yeah. Um, and we'd often wake up tired. And I know that, you know, that he struggled with that. And I think you just have to keep in check. I also know um, CMOs who have a box in their hall that they put their phone in. And whenever they come in uh, after work and the, the phone doesn't leave the box until they leave in the morning. And that's out of respect of separating the two things. Um, I think you kind of have to find those little tricks. Mm. You know, but at the same time, you know, I. I run a I run a business that's based in Edinburgh that has international clients. And if you want to work on that type of work, you need to get on a plane. And that's just a fact of life. You know, we talk about video calls and how we're going to have telepresence and uh, you know, it's not the same. It's never going to be the same. I mean, we yes, every time a meeting request comes in, you need to ask yourself, look, do I really need to get on a plane to have this meeting? But from time to time, you've got to go and meet people. So you know, you just gotta find. I've gotta find ways of balancing that, um, and the the ability. I think the the actual bigger thing is is the physical presence and mental presence. So especially at this, this first couple of years of the business, where my mind was just racing with the amount of things that I was, you know, um, I could, couldn't slow my brain down, mm. and. That's that's a problem if you're meant to be present with your wife and kids and your brain's still going because you, you're physically there but you're mentally not there. Yeah. Um, and also even just you know managing your own emotional responses to things. You know, if you've had a stressful day and you come back to to your your house and your 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 kids tired and grumpy, well you can't take it out on them. <laughs> no. You know they're too. So yeah, you kind of got to, I think that's been a big learning over the last three years is, you know, I, I get up every morning, I meditate, I, you know, keep appreciation diaries, I, um, I make sure to keep on top of how much I drink, do I exercise, things like that. All yeah. the things that you, you read in articles whenever people are, are bumming about, yeah. you know, what it means to be a, a business person. To me, that's, that's not, 
that's not a fad. That that is just you need to keep on top of that stuff, otherwise you're not gonna be no, there'll just be good. an imbalance somewhere, whether you know it yeah. or not, it'll come bubbling to the surface whether you like yep. it or not. And, and it'll come out somewhere you don't want it to. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and yeah, I I try obviously my best with like things, you know, like meditation apps and I obviously do a lot of exercise and things like that as well. And if I didn't you have You do that, a hell of a lot more exercise than I am. <laughs> I can tell you that. Yeah, probably too much though. But uh, if there if there is such a thing, but um, you know, just like simple things like I remember when I first started commuting to work uh, after moving house. Like I used to live thirty seconds away from work, and now I live an hour's drive away from work. Uh-huh. And I just used to spend that time listening to music and you know whatever. And for now, that is like well, that's like two hours per day you know going to and from work that is completely productive time that i can be doing something productive in as well so you know audiobooks and podcasts that are mm-hmm. actually I try and balance it with podcasts that are just light-hearted funny ones and or audiobooks that are you know novels but most of the time it's like a some form of educational like leadership book or strategy book or something like that it's actually going to benefit me because i just feel like otherwise like that's an error that i'm just dossing about doing nothing when i could actually be doing i mean there's a limit to what you could do you can't meditate while you're in the car or anything like that but uh that'd be pretty dangerous but just trying to <laughs> trying to turn it to somewhat <laughs> productive time yeah um do you take that, that you, you've downtime for yourself as well though like what what do you do to to switch off the exercise yeah. is the biggest one for me like almost most nights when i get home i basically come in check in with the other half and catch up on each other's days and then I go out to the gym Mm. and I'll be there for like minimum an hour if not 90 minutes come back in have dinner and then that's but if I don't do that it's weird it's like a smoker without a cigarette I just get so irritable and like you know the missus tells that as well and she there's often times that she'll tell me to go to the gym because she knows that it's on my mind and it's bothering me and, and like you said i'm not mentally present yeah and yeah. kind of paying attention to stuff so go out and do that yeah. so but if i didn't have that i don't know yeah but luckily i do so I don't have yeah. to worry about that you, too much but y- yeah you need that and other hobbies like i i you know i've got a question in here very selfishly about uh cars because i know you're a fellow petrol head as well oh, so yeah. you know i enjoy my cars i've got you know other kind of hobbies that keep me level-headed i suppose but yeah well you know there's there's that uh, i went for a uh uh i went for a massage once it was a, a gift voucher for christmas and they had a the, one of these cheesy pictures up on the wall that says you know if uh you can't pour from an empty cup <laughs> you know yeah. and yeah it's, it's bloody cheesy but it's it's true yeah you know if you're not if you don't spend that spend a little bit of time on yourself then um then yeah you've you've got nothing left to give and i think a lot lot of stuff in meditation talks talk to that point you know if if you're if you're not kind to yourself if you don't uh, just check it in with yourself like well yeah yeah absolutely checking in with yourself but also spend a little bit of time on yourself and making sure that you're you're uh you're mentally and physically healthy because otherwise you can't really look after other people. Yeah, definitely. Um, like I was saying, I've got one question, which is purely out of selfish interest in the subject matter because you're a big <laughs> petrol head like myself. But uh, what car brand would you love to work with and doing what kind of project and why? Oh, man. Yeah, I'm petrol head. Mm-hmm. Um, and weirdly, I'm not... I'm not um, I'm not good with facts and figures. I can't. I'm not a petrol head who's going to be able to tell you what the displacement is on. Oh, a, no. I, I can't do it. But I, I just. I can just tell you what I like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I mean, uh, yeah, and, and I, I, I remember, I remember moments as a kid that are are very related to petrol. That I just, you know, just like, oh, that's that that's beautiful. Like you know, whenever in Top Gun, Kelly McGuinness comes over the comes over the rise. In a, in a in her Porsche, and you're just oh my god, that thing is stunning. Yeah, and oh, girls are interesting too. <laughs> or like bad boys with Will Smith's Porsche that he had in that. Oh and, man. Uh, yeah, and you know a nice uh, a nice 
uh, camera swoop as you stand up. Yeah, it has to be standing beside a, a cool car. Um, and my my uh, my dad restored vintage cars. And, ah, cool. And he often tells the story of you know growing up in uh, the Falls Road in Belfast during the during the troubles. His dad would try and keep him out of trouble by bringing home motorbikes that needed to be fixed. And because he knew if he was in the backyard working on a motorbike, he wasn't out on the streets. Yeah, doing something bad. Yeah, or just, you know, being in a dangerous environment. So I, you know, my dad always had me helping him to restore cars. So I kind of, I, I actually owe a lot of being a designer to that. Because my dad's one thing was, look, if you start something, you've got to finish it. doesn't matter if you hate it. doesn't matter if, you know, lying underneath that car, scraping crap off it at yeah. 10 o'clock at night when your mates are out of the pub. You started it, you're going to finish it. Yeah, my mom and dad were the same. I'm yeah. so glad, you know, like the amount of times that I had a shitty job that I didn't want to go back to. Or even, even in school, <laughs> I remember a parents' evening where... Uh, they were the teacher and my mum were claiming that he's been really negative towards the subject and i was like i'm not being negative towards the subject i just don't want to do it <laughs> <laughs> and then my, in my head that made, made perfect sense obviously you know i realized that i was wrong but i had to reset the subject and then you know it all kind of worked out but it was just <laughs> yeah. but like it was just the kind of mentality he's like no you will do it rather than slacking off or you yeah. know whatever it may be that kind of instilling that ethic in you yeah yeah um so going back back to the back to the question though you know, um oh god which which petrol brand so i mean I've, I've recently started riding motorbikes um about two years ago um yeah around the same time i had kids maybe that wasn't the best idea either <laughs> Just kind of just, Another added risk. You know, this podcast wasn't a great idea. It's made, it made me realize a lot of things. <laughs> Exposing you. Um, so I, I really, I love, I love riding motorbikes. Like I didn't realize just how much I was going to love it. Um, and I've already, I've already crashed motorbike and written it off. Not, not a, not a, you know, high speed, uh, you know, metal scraping accent. I kind of just went a bit slow and then fell on its side. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing too dramatic there. No, no, there was, uh, there was plenty of wet. Did you have to visit the hospital? No, but I do. I am considering it because um, my little finger now clicks a lot and it doesn't have the same range of movement. About a, <laughs> a year later, I think I actually did some damage. Oh. But. Um, but yeah, so I, I think to, to answer the question, there's, there's probably two sides to it. One is um, I'd love to do something with someone like Ducati where it is purely about the the, the feeling of riding a motorbike and um, the connection between the rider and the engine. And I think that you don't, okay. you don't get that as much in car advertising. They, they try to, you know, they try to, you know, metaphors of tigers and things. And, <laughs> that, you know, Some of them are awful. Oh, they are absolutely god awful. Some of them stray into the same territory that aftershave and perfume ads go into, where you're just exactly. like, what the fuck is this it's about? It's sort of the, the, the woman or the man you could be type stuff. Yeah. You know, it's uh, you're, you're getting out of a, a car and uh, putting your arm around a attractive person and going into a restaurant yeah where i think i think where motorbikes you're really talking to 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 somebody who yeah you know i'm sure a girl getting off a motorbike and taking off the helmet and putting their their hair down or or a guy putting his, his uh, aviator sunglasses on is probably <laughs> doing it for, for the ego but generally i think people who ride motorbikes do it because it's it's the experience of riding yeah, it's a far more niche audience, I suppose. Yeah, so, so. I think something's purely about the experience of riding would be interesting. Um, and I think on the car side, then you kind of have to go to the other end. It's what's the brand? You know, what's the, which brands really make you feel that they care deeply about the design and craft of that car? So, you know, your, your Aston Martins, your, your Porsches, um, you know, it's it's less for me about the fact that you know the racing heritage, etc. It's more it's more you know the, the craft that went into mm. it. And I think it's a really interesting time to look at prestige cars. I went to the Ferrari exhibition at the Design Museum. I think it was last year. And the very end of it, um, the one of the the owners or one of the, the 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 head guys was asked, "What's the future for Ferrari?" And he says, "Nobody's going to own a Ferrari." I'm like, Whoa, what? He says, "Well." People, there's no real reason in the future to own one. 
yeah. you know, you, you'll lease it. And he says, we're already starting this. You know, you, you'll uh, you'll go to a expensive hotel and it'll be part of the, the deal is that you, you know, you get yeah, access Ferrari. to a Ferrari or you, especially as, as you're at those prestige brands they are looking to sell to fewer number of people with higher return, then, you know, it's okay. I'm going to, I'm going to buy into a subscription for Ferrari. You know, if, if the Ferrari La Ferrari came out and nobody was, there, there was no waiting list because they were already sold. Yeah. They were sold before anyone even got shown the design of the car. <laughs> Look, this car is coming out. It's going to be epic. There's only going to be X amount of them. Do you want it? Yes. <laughs> yes. I Sign me up. <laughs> Take my money. Scarcity? Car? Yes. <laughs> Um, so I love that. I love that. Just pure. You see the new Lotus belief. electric thing that came out the other day, the Avaya. Ooh, no. So it's the UK's first electric hypercar. Right. And it's going to do like zero to 120 in like four seconds or something ludicrous. Uh -huh. The thing looks ludicrous and the price is also equally ludicrous. Right. How hazard a guess of how much do you oh, think it man, costs? Oh no, I I think it's just it's just silly, silly money. One point seven five million. Jesus, Jesus. Um, how there's only you, how, a, how, only a hundred thirty of them, so they're obviously just gonna do. They're just doing it to kind of you know put their flag in the sand and yeah. kind of make their mark. But it's it's, a, it's an odd you know. How do you feel about electric cars? Um, I'm a bit torn. When they, I'm more kind of interested in hybrids mm -hmm. than fully electric cars. Ooh. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. But I would love, just purely from a cost and financial standpoint, like I, I have a commuting car and then I have my fun car. <laughs> and uh, I would love my commuter car to obviously, like, if it was like electric or hybrid and like I could get a gazillion miles out of the tank rather than having to fill it up with, you know, whatever... Yeah. once a week then that would be fantastic so i like it from that standpoint i am never probably going to not have a petrol car at some point unless it's made illegal mm -hmm. like you're never going to be able to replace the sound when you turn on a lovely engine and go for a drive and you hear the you can like almost feel the engine you can hear the engine i don't care if they play a fake engine through the sound system it's not the same uh, that's why I, I'm still and Teslas as well. I'm just not on that bandwagon either. They really? look like oh, just like again talking about the design of them. Yeah, they look like Ford Mondeos, but you're, you're spending <laughs> a ludicrous amount of money on them, and it's just like <laughs> if you're spending, if I'm spending that amount of money, I want to feel like I'm in luxury. And you go inside, and there's nothing apart from a giant iPad, and it's just like you need to get somebody like hire the you know chief interior designer from Aston Martin and get them to Tesla immediately because something needs improved. I'm I, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I totally I, Like I totally the whole autonomous it. thing and all that, I'm I, I, like, I'm a total heavy, oh, like, I geek, heavy, heavy skeptic of all this stuff. Are you? Oh, yeah. I, I, I totally geek out on that stuff. I, I mean, I, like, I, don't get me wrong, would it be amazing to be able to just sleep in your car and then I wake up and I'm at work? Yeah, but I just, I don't trust computers that much. I think you can, uh, yeah, I... I I back that two car thing. So if, you know, just back from... from I'm saving from, the planet on one hand and then I'm just trying <laughs> on the other. <laughs> well, um, you know, just been on holiday, you know, driving four hours through France, you know, um, the speeding laws there are exceptionally tight. I didn't I didn't realize this. I got I got three speeding fines. Uh, and... <laughs> And I didn't. I swear to God, there's not. It's not a, a brag or any of that. I don't. I don't condone speeding, um, but I just didn't realize that they don't have the same. You know, in the UK, there's about ten percent give. Mm. So whenever I get onto the highway and I put on um, cruise control, you um, know, you, if you set at seventy five, you're probably fine. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, it was one hundred and ten kilometers per per hour. So I was like, okay, well, I'll put that to one fourteen and then sit back and relax on the cruise control. Three speeding tickets. So. You know, in that world, what's the point? You know, what is what is the point in having a car that can do not to sixty in one point nine seconds, which is what the, the new, new Tesla, Tesla is going to do? Like, seriously, what is the point? 
you know, you, you may as well have something that you can hit a button and it drives itself. And then I can sit back and, as you were saying earlier, listen to your podcasts or, yeah. or you know, do whatever, whatever you want to do with that time. But I live in Edinburgh. <laughs> and Edinburgh, the road is road traffic is absolutely horrific, but it also has free motorbike parking, and it's just a perfect place to, to ride a motorbike. Mm. I can it's you know thirty minutes on a good day, forty five minutes on a on a regular day uh, to get from one side of the city to the other if you're lucky, um, and as in yeah yeah to get from one side of Princess Street to the other yeah on a motorbike you can do that and. Without breaking any laws, uh, you can do that in ten minutes, tops. Yeah. You know, so there's there's two different modes of driving there, and and it makes you and as a rider, it just feels fantastic. So uh, did that? I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, you kind of did. Kind of did. Ducati and the kind of feeling of being on a bike, and then a you know a luxury car brand and working on the brand. Yeah, where well, you don't actually buy the car, you're actually just buying into buying into the brand. Yeah. I think that's the future of, of high end stuff, of high end cars as well. Yeah. Uh, last question, very mm -hmm. quickly. Um, I've worked with you personally as you were my creative director when we both worked at Realize. Sure, and man. I can't really remember, it's maybe just my memory, So, but I can't really remember a time that I've ever seen you like super pissed off or angry. <laughs> uh, maybe I was just lucky, but. Um, you know, well, not necessarily at staff or like, you know, I mean about a particular subject or something like that. So is there something that really annoys you about the creative industry that you've been holding in this whole time? <laughs> <laughs> well, there was that You can tell us. It's fine. Uh, well, you know, I've been waiting to bring this up with you. Do you remember, <laughs> do you remember that time? Uh, ah. My mum my always said I'm so laid back, I'm horizontal. I think yeah. I think that that's probably changed a little bit in the last couple of years since uh, having kids and, and all the stuff we've covered in the podcast. Um, I th I think what 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 grinds what grinds my gears <laughs> when it comes to design is um, the wasted time. There's a lot of procrastination bad briefing, design it to explore a question rather than to answer a question, a lot of bad waterfall processes, a lot of bad collaboration between different disciplines and not respecting each other's disciplines. Um, it's wasted time. Yeah. You know, it, it's if it's taken you six months to get a piece of design in front of a person that might use it, you've wasted six months. Yeah, and that's wasted money, and you've also just more importantly wasted the very little time you have on the spinning blue marble. <laughs> yeah. What the hell are you doing? Yeah, you know I, I love the story of whenever I think Million Pound Drop was owned by Endemol. I can't remember, um, but they whenever they wanted to sell it into Channel Four, uh, came in with four cardboard boxes and some blocks of paper. And if you remember a million pound drop, yeah. you, you, you split up your blocks of money across the four cardboard boxes. And then, you know, the, the answers that are wrong, the, the, sorry, the, the cardboard boxes, then they pushed open and let the rest of the money drop. So, you know, that could have been six months to a year of development of, of making something really slick and bringing someone into a studio or whatever you want to do or 3D, yeah. 3D renders of the studio. Four cardboard boxes, that's what you need. Stop pissing to around. The experience almost. Stop doubting yourself. Stop, stop fiddling with a tiny pixel and moving it from left to right or working out whether the kerning's right or going through 600 fonts to find the right one. Just bloody make the thing. Yeah. Wasted time. That's what gr grinds my gears. Cool. So... <laughs> Are you going to get me riled up and then send me out into the world? <laughs> Pretty much. God That's help. where we're going to wrap God it up. God help my next meeting. <laughs> uh, so tell the people who are listening... Where they mm -hmm. can find out more about Create Future and yourself and whatever channels? Um, MySpace, mostly. <laughs> I've got a really good Geo, Geo City site. Uh, I the, honestly get in touch personally. Mm. Is there's always the number one thing I would say. Um, if it's for for anything, just ping me. Um, get get in touch. Mostly, I 
I'm on LinkedIn for sharing things that I find interesting. And these days I've actually come back to Twitter uh, for, for just a bit of banter. Um, I very rarely talk about work stuff on Twitter. I do all my work stuff talking on LinkedIn and that's the two main places. But yeah, I mean, go to the Create Future website if you want to, if you want to get in touch with me personally, I'd prefer that. Cool. But thanks very much for having me in to have a good run. Ah, don't be silly. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Best. Really appreciate it. And, you know, Create Future, you've been absolutely killing it the past three years and, you know, everything that you're doing seems to be going from strength to strength, whether it's your work or even just the YouTube series and stuff like that, which helped oh, inspire that. this podcast, oh, as you, you know. So I'll always be keeping my eyes peeled for the next cool thing you guys are working on. But yeah, thank you for coming on. Oh, good luck with the podcast. Thank you very much. And to wrap up, as per usual, please head over to the website, the mitmpodcast.com. That's the mitmpodcast.com. You'll be able to find out all the show notes, any kind of links or anything that Dave and I have discussed today will be on there. You can find out more about the show and how you can personally support the show too. Make sure you head over to your favorite podcast platform, hit the subscribe button, and make sure you get notified when the next episode goes up. Plus, while you're there, leave a review. It is great to hear what people think, but it also helps bring other people into the show and kind of help advertise the show as well. So that's it from us here. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you found some method in the madness.